All right. Hi, beekeepers. How is everyone today? Um, today in our wonderful series of women creating new foundations, we have with us, M. Wode is here to talk to us about death doulas. So, M, before we get started, just let me know how you'd like me to refer to you. And if you care to share your gender pronouns, that would be welcome. Hey, um, M is great. Thank you. Uh, binary pronoun is she. Okay, perfect. Sure. Yes. Thank you. So a lot of people that might be listening today uh, might not be familiar with what is a death doula. So I'm curious if you'd be willing to share with us what what is that? Uh, death doula is an inherent understanding in every culture since the beginning of time. Every single person is a death doula. Um, yeah, I think so. Does that answer your question? Tell me more about what you mean about every single person is a death doula. Well, um, through the training that I took, um, I think it was just a reminder of something that I've always known. And that is that death is confronted every day. And I think in every moment of every day, considering the exhale, um, a rebirth of each moment. But um, it's kind of, death is kind of put into a box of um, what we think grief looks like, what we've been told grief looks like, the stages of grief, um, and what we think death is. So when I say that everybody is a death doula, I mean that everyone shows up for a loved one um, who is dying, whether or not they have extensive uh, end of life doula training or not. I think it's something inherent in us and it's prevalent you know, since the beginning of time in each culture. I can expand on that further if you need me to. Sure, I'm so um, fascinated that you brought up grief and death and this moment to moment um, experience. You know, in, in my own meditation practice, I find we're always practicing our death, right? The moment that is past is dead it's and so each exhale we continue to move through this like linear time because we're embodied we live in this human body and i wonder um in western culture if you encounter people who d have a distaste or discomfort with really just acknowledging that we are all inevitably going to leave our body in whatever way that looks like i'm just curious what what you feel about that um, in Western culture, it's hard to have anything to compare it to firsthand, considering I've never really left the country. Um, but just based on the books that I've read and the conversations I've had with other people, um, it seems as if I'll go back to culture, every culture approaches end of life care and the, end, the reality of end of life differently. But I think I've noticed that even other cultures that um, it's not America, not necessarily a Western culture, still seems to be a disconnect from the nature of death, the reality of it. And I think that that comes with the advances in technology. And um, I think the, the, the more we, um, I don't know, live with electronics and technology, it might bring us further away from our natural ability to cope with death. Um, so especially in this culture, Western culture, we are even more um, invested in technology and consumerism and everything that's made to keep us distracted from the truth. Um, so I think there's a 
lot of differences in how the Western culture were, were is to like were to view death, right? As opposed to other cultures, as far as I know, but my knowledge is limited. But I do think that there's a lot of similarities as well, and in, in regards to the fact that um, it's it seems like it's almost becoming harder and harder for people to talk about as time goes on and as it, uh, technology advances. And this need that we have to constantly be moving, 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 consuming, don't really have, we don't really allow ourselves time to really stop and think about our mortality, our, our um, legacy, the way we've impacted the, the planet, the way we've impacted each other, the way we've impacted ourselves and what we're gonna leave behind when we do die. So that's something that, that gets incorporated into the practice of sort of uh, facing death. I'm just recalling a conversation I had earlier this week where I had a client say to me, you know, if I die. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm wondering if there's sort of this illusion that, that you're offering through this, you know, consumerism and the, the wanting to have things, tangible forms that removes us from the nature of that, which is, which is, everything that is born will die. Right. Also an idea that birth and death and doesn't mean the same as beginning and end. Death nor birth comes first. Um, so we have this idea in our head also, if I die, right? It's like, I can't really fathom this um, because right now I just have like these things in front of me that I can see. I think it's really hard for people to grasp to understand that it's inevitable that they're going to die because to them that seems like the end. Um, but who's to say that birth is the beginning and death is the end, right? And who's to say which one does come first? I do see it as a circle of eternity that doesn't stop. Um, so I can understand someone saying if, right? Because how do we grasp this concept that I won't be on this planet anymore? But I think that we just may not be here in this meat suit but the cells continue to fall off of us throughout the day anyway. So we're constantly dying and changing throughout the day, as I've said, you know, especially with the inhale and the exhale. Am I working with you so far? Yeah, this is all, it's, it's actually um, taking me in so many directions and I'm, I'm just wanting help. to um, find this connection to between our cultural avoidance of grief and and sort of one of the things that we discuss quite a bit in these um in our meditations and things are embodying our elemental nature of being part of nature we are connected to earth um, and we're an aspect of nature human beings are and i wonder if it's part of death might be connected to grief and those distasteful feelings that come along with it, the anger, the feeling betrayed, feeling resentful. And I'm curious, if, you know, what experience or tools could you offer to people to really learn to have grief, to embody their sadness, that grief is appropriate for our sentience, is it not? Grief is so appropriate. And it's so human. And it's <clears throat> so lovely um, for lack of broad vocabulary. Um, it's hard uh, for me, someone who's like grieved for different reasons, right? I know personally how it has affected me and I know that it's really, really hard. Um, I think that going back to what I mentioned earlier about legacy, right? And how one impacts the, the not only the planet, but their loved ones and themselves and everything that they, they do on a daily basis. I never even considered my own mortality and my own legacy before until I was prompted to do so. And I think that perhaps if people allow themselves more space and time to consider the impact that they've made 
it could lead them and perhaps open the door and open up a space to start the grieving process even before someone dies or even before there's a reason to grieve. Um, almost like preparing yourself for, um, for how people are gonna feel about you when you leave, right? When you do die. So, and then grieve with them maybe before you die and embody it as something to offer praise to as opposed to something to be afraid of. There's a great book. I haven't read it yet. It's called The Smell of Rain on Dust. Um, and it's about grief and praise. So we could start really, really simple and really literal and just pick up a book, right? To start to learn about grief and to learn about maybe other people's experiences with it and how you can relate or how you can't relate or how your journey is different from somebody else's. Also recognizing that grief comes in many forms and it's not just when someone dies. We grieve the loss of so many things, you know, our, when, when, when we change as a person, grieve the loss of who one used to be perhaps. Also grieving the loss of a relationship or um, quitting a job. I think grief is just constantly in our lives every day, all day. We may not recognize it for what it really is. So we can start with a small gesture of just maybe reading or listening as opposed to having to like dive into something so grand right away. I don't think that's always completely necessary. So <clears throat> I guess the, the question that comes to mind too is um, what about groups do you find um, when you grieve in community that there is a softening of the grief or do you do you find that people who grieve alone is there a difference i'm asking these grief questions because they're so um connected sort of enmeshed for lack of a better way with death death seems to be what brings up our grief into our face right mm -hmm. so i'm curious about people coming and saying, um, it's 18 months, like I should be through this. Ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, that's um, my question in yeah. a roundabout way. Yeah, well, we can also go back to the Western culture and this type of society, um, this consumerism society, this capitalist society where we're kind of like made to work so I think that's where that idea comes from of that, um, the timeline on grief. Um, it's been 18 months. Um, I shouldn't be feeling this way anymore. I think that's kind of like a deep rooted brainwashing in us because we're just so used to working all the time. And then if we stop working and we take time to really feel this, it can be like really uncomfortable. And especially if I don't allow myself the space to feel that and I just go back to work, I've noticed that grief can come back just as heavy as it was if I don't give it the space to expand. So from my personal view, grief doesn't go away, it changes um, if I allow the space and the time for it to do so. Now, as far as someone grieving alone or someone grieving in a group, I'm a huge fan of Sangha, a Buddhist term for community, right? And I think that um, connection can be the opposite of so many things. And that would include violence. Um, and I think that isolation can produce some sort of violence, right? Maybe it's like in your head or your heart. For my grief, um, I haven't ever grieved alone. I'm very, very, very open about how I'm feeling and my emotions. And what I found with my, you know, my best friend who died um, two years ago in a motorcycle accident, what I found was I had everything that I needed from the people in my tribe. And mostly that sound, it was to me, people ma making space and maintaining space for the grief. The thing that I found that I needed that I didn't have was something physical. And that would be probably like, like a sauna 
like I felt like a wet like like I felt like I was like a wet fetus like in the womb and I just needed to like sweat all this out so as far as emotional support I felt like all of my needs were met because I made the conscious choice not to isolate in the grief I don't think there's anything wrong though with any choice that anybody makes because that's their path so I can't speak super true to the idea of grieving alone although I suppose that I have in the past but as far as this big death grief that we're talking about when someone dies and it throws grief kind of in your face when it came to that really big like heaviness like that cloak that was on me for months and months and months this heavy cloak um I would say that um I was just very very open about it with everyone in my close tribe and it was very beneficial for me and continuing my education to learn about end-of-life care has also helped me come to an understanding about um, that it's okay to grieve and there's no timeline and there's no set way for how it's supposed to be and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross when she talked about these stages of grief right it was kind of like referenced as like, these are the stages of grief. You have the bartering and you have the, the denial and you have these other things and I can't think of them all. And it's stated that they're not gonna come in a, in a certain pattern, right? And they're not, and sometimes you're gonna experience all at once or two at once or none at once. But really I think she may have been slightly misunderstood. And instead of really identifying these like stages of grief, I think she was more or less talking about the things that we feel while we are grieving. So when someone hears about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and this idea she laid out for these different stages of grief, they hyper-focus on this, it seems like, and then this is how I'm supposed to grieve. This is what it's supposed to feel like. And I don't think it's supposed to last that long because how long can these stages really last? But I think Elizabeth Kubler-Ross really meant, I no one can tell you what your grief is going to feel like and no one can tell me what mine feels like, but I think El Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was trying to kind of just lay out an outline for this might, this could be what you might expect these types of feelings during your grief. You might feel like bartering, you might feel denial, you know, things like that. Um, but it's really tough to put grief in like a box or like a linear structure because it's different for everybody. So I appreciate too that you talked about the linear um, time because I, I I feel that that grief can get really kind of enmeshed and entangled and we are such complicated beings that years later you may grieve a loss because perhaps you weren't ready at the time and then when it really settles you know, it's extraordinary to me, like I can feel the gratitude for the precious moments with friends I have lost and be sad at the same time. Mm. So it's complicated. It's I think not so. linear, like you were saying. Hmm. I think so. And so, so with death, what would, if I were leaving, getting ready to make my transition to wherever in my belief system we return to our rightful place in the universe not mm -hmm. that this is not the rightful place right um and part of my yoga practice has always been practicing my death right mm. so i can see oh i didn't tell this person how much i have appreciated mm. these precious moments of our coffee together or mm. walk through town <clears throat> and so my grief when it visits, I find this tempering with appreciative joy or gratitude for the precious moments I have with the being on earth. So that is helpful. And I notice um, if I'm so curious because people that don't have a, an appreciative joy or gratitude practice with friends or family, I'm curious with end of life, if I were to make my transition, what would and I said, oh, um, would you come? What would happen? What would that look like when I'm getting ready to leave? What would be your role? Um, my role as a doula? 
or my role as M as a friend, we're talking about me if I came to you as a death doula, right? Oh, well, that is advocacy. Okay, so if we imagine I walk alongside you in this journey as opposed to leading you in any direction. So that would be me sitting next to you. And um, I keep going back to making this space. And then once we make it, it's really important for the doula to maintain the space. Um, so if one day I come and you are like, I am in a terrible mood. I feel like hell, I don't want to eat and I don't want to talk to you. I'd probably be like, okay, do you want to talk about that? And you'd be like, either you'd say yes or you'd say no. And if you say, yeah, let's talk about the fact that I don't want you here right now. So it's almost as if you can't really, so it's like, uh, like I said, walking alongside somebody. There are a lot of things that people go through emotionally when they know that they're going to die. It's a lot of like ups and downs with the feelings. So it can be one day you feel at peace with your um, soon to be death. And then there are other days where you're just so frustrated. Like, why is this happening to me today? Like, what did I do to deserve this? So the doula's role is to just make and maintain the space for your journey and like your path, wherever that leads. And there's no right or wrong way for that to go. And it's really important for the doula to be an advocate for the dying person um, if they want to plan a type of vigil, you know, for a couple of days before they know they're going to die, right? Like they can probably feel it. And um, so the doula would help them with their vigil. And that could be like, how do you want your room set up? Do you want windows open? Do you want candles? Do you want music? Do you want food? Who do you not want to come? Because I can keep them out of the room for you. You know what I mean? It's like that type of thing. And then also if, if, if the dying person wants to talk about their legacy, and if they wanna talk about what kind of legacy they wanna leave behind. And if once they've passed, if they want their friends to have a party or a ceremony or do something um, for, the, for the person that had just died. So as the doula and you, you know, hypothetically as the dying person, um, I would come to you, I would make the space and just simply walk alongside you in the journey without leading you in any direction that I think you need to be going in, because this is all your choice and how you want to pass over. Does that answer your question? Kind of. It does. It resonates really um, strongly, too, with our, you know, our hive, right? So there's this spiraling out from the community that the community is there to support as people spiral up and and travel among their rungs in whatever direction they choose. They know that there's this cohesive unit that just supports them mm -hmm. in their journey. And it sounds like you've created through your doula ship, if that's the correct word, that there's this holding container that mm -hmm. the person leaving this earth journey with all of its pains and sorrows and joys and blisses and all of the things that they've learned on their journey gets to choose. There's this huge sense I'm getting in my body of empowerment that I don't maybe want this member of my family who's going to try to get a doctor and all these things when I've made these choices. And I want to go in a certain way and maybe they don't like my African dance music and they'll want to change it. You know what I'm, so it feels like it's a very way, it's a just, it's almost like a womb space you're creating where we're brought into the world from this water that's protected us. And we're leaving in the same way is what it feels like. Am I understanding you correctly? I think so. Yeah, and that a lot of people say, what the heck? is a death doula and I'm like you know what a birth doula is right and they're like yeah of course and I'm like it's just the opposite like <laughs> as opposed to ushering the new being in um that new being doesn't have a say in how they're brought in the mother decides if they're gonna have it in the hospital or have the baby at home c-section that's a section epidural not epidural the doctors how the baby's gonna be treated when the baby comes out the baby's gonna get slapped on the butt or if it's gonna go right to the the chest 
the baby doesn't have that choice. The doula is there to advocate for the mother and like making sure that the birth goes the way she wants it to. So we usher the little being in, welcome, welcome to this plane. And then the dying person does have more of a choice because they're, they've grown and they have experience and they have karmic memory and they have karmic consequence. So uh, when people ask, I'm like, just imagine the opposite of a birth doula. So instead of ushering in the being, I'm ushering them out the way they want to be ushered out. Yeah. A lot of people don't, some people don't seem to understand why it's important, which I think is interesting because it's almost, they're like, well, I, it's so important for the birth to be exactly perfect. I'm like, well, the baby doesn't even get a say in that. Then the baby grows up and then the baby gets to choose how they get, how they get to go. And I think, I think it's, I think it's great. And some people don't want a, a doula. Some people don't want anything. Some people don't have family. Some people don't have friends, a dying person, and they might only have the doula, you know, and maybe they have all these resentments and these forgivenesses that they need to work out. So then the doula sits and makes space and listens to them while they regurgitate their feelings about their life and their, their legacy and what they've done and what they, what they think they're going to leave behind, what they do or what they don't want to leave behind. Yeah. So I imagine doing this work, you have to practice a form of self-care and you mentioned Sangha, which resonates with me because um, of my meditation teaching. And I'm curious, um, how do you take care of your body and yourself in order to do this very powerful, it sounds very deep and profound. And I imagine it runs through your body an enormous amount of energy. And I'm just curious, how do you manage that? Uh, self-care is highly emphasized during the training. And I've, I've, I know the importance of self-care over the past couple of years, but I, even so after this doula training, it's definitely, um, permeated more about how important it is. Um, for me personally, the best way I manage myself is maintaining sobriety. Okay. And what that does for me is it just allows me a lot of emotional availability. It allows me a lot of emotional space. It allows me mental availability, not only with myself, but being able to take in other people's energies. So that's one thing that aids me. And I didn't become sober to be the doula. It just happened to that I was sober before. And then I'm realizing how beneficial it is to maintain that for me because it allows me the space to stay open and available. Availability, one of my favorite things. Um, and I suppose becoming comfortable with silence is probably a good self-care practice as well in regards to like me, um, you know, practicing end of life care, end of life advocacy work. And we also just have the um, showing up for the self is super crucial. And boundaries, I'd say boundaries are very important. So if I have a loved one that's really close to me, a family member or a friend who is dying, um, I will not be their doula. I can help them find one. But for me, I need to maintain that space for myself. So it's about knowing the boundaries as well, how you can and how you can't help. So self-care involves a lot of like um, emotional response, but it also involves physical things too. Um, you know, being active, if you want to, don't have to exercise, maybe just like move your body around and whatever that means to you, right? Ex um, getting some like old energy out, just like moving the body around, um, moving the energy around in the space that you're in and probably, um, you know, making sure you drink plenty of water and making sure that you eat the foods that make your body feel good. Um, you don't have to be a health nut, right? But I think self-care is whatever that means to you. For me, self-care really a lot of times is being alone completely and watching 
a television show. And I used to feel guilty about that. You know, I'm lazy. I like to watch TV. But then I'm realizing that I kind of love the way I do my self-care um, because I know that it's my truth. So we have to, uh, one would probably have to identify what their truth is. If we want to start with how do, how do we make boundaries? How do we um, maintain self-care? I think it's assessing your values and what's important to you in life. So if we know what our, if I know what my values are in life, it gives me a better leg to stand on of how I can take care of myself. So thank you for bringing up boundaries. Um, <laughs> yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Did it just bring you? <laughs> we talk a lot about boundaries and it allows, um, I'm, it allows for me, good boundaries allow for greater compassion for myself when those old judgmental thoughts will come up like watching a TV show, right? And instead of criticizing myself for being lazy and watching a TV show, I can have compassion. Like this is just an experience I'm having in this moment. Sure. Um, and boundaries around other people and what I can and cannot do. Am I strong enough to do this? Am mm -hmm. I equipped to do this? Is this my skill set? And I think those are really amazing points that you brought up because this whole Beekeepers Collective is all about knowing yourself. And it's interesting, there's a false self and then there's that real self. <laughs> and, when you, and you talked about sobriety and emotional sobriety specifically and I find in Sangha, you know, when we take these to be free of intoxicants and not harm and not harm ourselves, like we are included within that boundary there and our community holds us accountable. They notice if we're not feeling well. And yeah. there's a huge opportunity there to have a boundary of a wise community that cares about caring it care they care about our feelings whether we are grieving like we talked about earlier or we are in bliss or we are practicing self-care or perhaps um our socks don't match you know it's inevitably going to be brought into our awareness without judgment there's not judgment there's care um and so i really appreciate that because i think um, a lot of people, you know, that talk about sobriety, it seems like it's a spiritual like gateway to other things, to opening a path. And it's really powerful and profound that you can hold this space in a container because it sounds like your mind has been able to open to such a wide expanse <laughs> of the circle and cycle of life. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's what it feels like. It feels like, um, uh, if I maintain the sobriety, I am, the, the container does seem to get bigger to bring in more information. I'm open to like more information, right? Yeah. So that's kind of like what, what you just said made me think about that more, more information and being able, like having the emotional um, ability to handle all the information and cope in a healthy way as opposed to making unhealthy choices that, you know, lead, lead someone down to the path that they've already been down, you know, why not try a new path? So it's interesting too, you're talking about a lot of information and, um, you know, there's nervous system reception and there's uh, mental perceptions and our obsession with forms through our eyes, what we can see um, and all of these things that we tend in meditation. And I'm really curious about this expanse of quality in death and grief that it seems that you're now embodying and the mm -hmm. ability to sort of travel between, between the worlds. And when you talked earlier, you mentioned that it was kind of like a cloak of mm -hmm. grief. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could just tell me what, what that is, what that sensation is this cloak of grief. I'm just curious because I'm sure people can resonate with that. And I just wondered if you would mind sharing what that feels like. Sure. Um, I think for anyone who's worn an actual cloak might be able to understand the, like maybe the heaviness of the fabric, right? And I feel like a lot of times cloaks are like made out of like a heavy fabric, maybe like wool or something of that nature and um, like a heavy cotton. 
Um, it's almost as if though the cloak wasn't fabric though, it was like a um, person. It felt like a being hanging on my back, right? Just always there. Kind of like their arms were like around the front of my shoulders, like from the back. Um, the, that feeling uh, uncomfortable, of course. <laughs> Uh, very uncomfortable. Um, that feeling is gone now, by the way, because as I said, the grief has changed, right? Um, it's still there, but it's changed. Um, but I remember just feeling as if I was just constantly kind of like trudging through mud um, during all day, every day. And I wrote a couple poems about this grief, right? And I do remember uh, there is one... Um, poem about grief about oh yeah how um I'm doing my day right and then all of a sudden I just freeze and I just stop and it's like checking out of reality for a second because you're just like thrown into this like abyss of like that's that reality there's that grief again so for me I would literally be doing something and literally like stop in my tracks and just have to like feel it for a minute and then it would pass. And in the beginning of the grief that would last for a while, that would last for hours, that like paralysis. Um, but then the paralysis got shorter and shorter amount of time. Now today, almost like two years later after my friend died, um, I have that every, very, very, like every once in a while, all of a sudden, cause I know that Nick's dead, right? And I know it all the time, every day, every minute. But there are some days I could be driving or something. All of a sudden, it's just like pop right in the head. And it's just like, oh, there it is again. But it's not as um, detrimental or as scary as it was before. Because I, I offer um, praise to myself through this journey, right? And then I offer praise to his life and like his journey. And I continue to use this and um, just give as much kindness and love as I can to other people. So it's um, this grief, particularly with Nick dying, opened up this door that led me down into this huge, gigantic abyss of acceptance, you know? So the, the grief totally translated to acceptance and I am insanely grateful I would love for Nick to be alive, yes, but the praise that I have found in his death is this gratitude for how much I've grown in such a short amount of time and how much more available I am and how much bigger my container has gotten with just that event, you know what I mean? So it must feel, I guess, going into the work that you do is there's a freedom for the family when they lose someone from this plane. They, there's a death. And then there's the sense of if you let it be and you surrender to it, just let it keep changing. It will, it will in, in, in its own time, in its own form, begin to move and transform. And we don't know what will look like once we've processed through the grief and it's changed into something else. And it's not... I think the uh, questions that usually come up are that there's this event, like one day I'll be over it. And it sounds mm. like it, it just keeps changing like life. Yeah. I think that what I've noticed in people and in my, it took me noticing it myself first to notice it in other people is that the, well, I think we know that change is probably one of the only constants in this world, like, like right now changing, like literally like right now, like, um, you know, so con uh, change is like one of the only constants and it's like probably one of the only absolutes that I know of other than death, right. Is change. So I feel like I've noticed this in myself and what I've seen in other people is when things are changing, they may not recognize it as change. They may just see it as something uncomfortable. So they push back. Yes. But they can't avoid the change. So to me, it only makes sense that grief would change because it's inevitable if it's going to change. It's just a matter of when. And I think it's just a matter of when the person is ready to like let that change and let the grief evolve 
and let it expand into something, whether that be praise or anger or whatever. But yeah, I don't think there's ever going to be a time, maybe for anybody, where it's like, oh, poof, gosh, glad that's over. Done grieving. Yay. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it'd be great. I think grief is great, but like, uh, yeah, no, I don't think, I think that's a false, a false, um, you know, hope to have. It's one more mental formation we could do without. <laughs> yes. Thank you for stating that so eloquently. Yes. So. All right, Emma, we are nearing our end of time. I so oh. appreciate your being with us today. And Love you is so there much. any final thoughts you want to share? Oh, Anything you'd girl. like to share with our little hive? Um, I don't know. I just, um, you know, buzz away, right? <laughs> like buzz, buzz, buzz. And um, maybe talk about death. Let's see if as a community and as a whole and as a group, we can, you know, make it easier to digest for people because this is something that we are all going to experience. It's inevitable. So we can be there for each other. Talk, let's talk more about death. Let's like see about like, you know, looking into death cafes and reading more about death and also thinking about your own death, right? And like your own mortality and what life may look like for you one day when you're on your deathbed. And you can practice doing these things with guided imagery, with meditations, with trance. If you're able to like put yourself in a trance state and with practice, you can maybe put yourself in that space to really know what it's going to feel like, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to die soon. Um, what does that feel like? How, how am I, how can I, how do, have I impacted the world and how can I continue to impact the world in a positive way? So when I do leave, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, if I'm not leaving anything behind, maybe not, but if I am leaving something behind something, something of love, right. And something of kindness and compassion. So that's it. I mean, that's, you know, I hate giving advice, but that's probably like the one thing I could say, let's just talk about it more. So I appreciate you uh, allowing me the space to talk about this. And I appreciate any, anybody who listens and, and enjoys this. Well, I appreciate your being with us today. And, um, you know, people may comment down below and um, we, you can, if you want to email the beekeepers, we can put you in touch with them. If you need um, a question answered or there's something that is, um, you know, hanging out there. But um, otherwise, I just want to thank you so much for being with us and sharing all of these great viewpoints. And um, I guess... Embracing death is the message that I'm going away from this wonderful interview with. Cool. To just be open to it and welcome it. Yeah, right. We can start there. Like I said, we can start small. We don't have to like dive in and overwhelm ourselves. We can start small with this. Yes. And maybe you'll come back and sit with us again and we'll go on a deeper exploration. How would that Oh, yeah, be? absolutely. I'm definitely open to it. Perfect. Thank you so much, and Wood, you. for being with us today. Enjoy Thank your day. You. Thank you. You too. <laughs>